Ms. Stahl's Housing Advisory Committee for November 10th, 2021. We have regrets from some members today, but uh, we do have quorum to proceed with our meeting. Uh, I'll ask for a motion for approval of the agenda. Moved by Lorraine, seconded by Jeff, all in favor? Thank you. I hope everyone had a chance to review the minutes from our October 27th meeting. I need a motion for adoption. Moved by Lindsay, seconded by Jeff, all in favor? Thank you. Okay. Uh, ask for disclosure of monetary interest with anything on today's agenda. I see no issues there. We have no delegation, so we'll go right to our priority uh, items. And the first one I wanted to discuss was um, we, we've we've had discussions before on universal accessible housing, and and the, we had recommend a motion to council, which was passed uh, just recently, uh, to lobby the province to make some changes to the interior building code that would. Uh, require developers to include universally accessible uh, apartments within developments. Now, I brought this back, uh, understanding that if that was to ever occur at a provincial level, uh, it's likely <laughs> to be a long way out. And considering we are in a, uh, a real building boom, wanted to discuss, um, well, we have no authority to require builders to include accessible units. I'm thinking um, one, and, and Carl isn't here yet. I don't, unless it's Carl uh, in the background there. Um, oh, he's not on yet. He will be. Okay. Uh, so I don't, if it would be something that could be included through an uh, affordable housing CIP. So we can ask Carl when, when he arrives. But second to that, um, about uh, even simply having a policy statement that would encourage builders to be as accommodative and perhaps a, a guide manual or locate a guide manual that would help them under, uh, developers and builders recognize that uh, the needs are there. And, and second to that, the, the additional cost uh, to Lindsay's point before uh, is maybe not significantly more in order to be able to uh, construct unit, units that are universally accessible. Uh, and a little bit of work, research I did, I noticed that like back in the 90s, um, the uh, federal government in the US had brought in a policy and, and a guidebook which had uh, required universally uh, accessible units to be built uh, so decades ago. And so I'm, I haven't found anything uh, for Ontario and perhaps we can do more research to, to do so. But I wanted to open it up to that. Uh, and Carl, just to bring you up to date, item A, the policy on accessible housing, uh, is, is there a method that we could use to encourage builders to include universally accessible units? And the question to you specifically, Carl, uh, would be, uh, can we, include that within our affordable housing CIP? Would there be possibility of an option which provide incentives or, uh, for developers to include universally accessible? So Lindsay, I'll, I'll go to Carl first and swing back to you and give your hand up. Yes, I, I think so, uh, Mr. Chair, and that's one, uh, and the best way to accomplish that would be something we would be uh, obviously looking to uh, for advice from the uh, from from the consultants who are are preparing that plan. But I believe that would be a main part of whatever, however it would work. If there's and and this may, and we may even be getting into the a sort of situation where we're looking at a certain number of ex, of affordable or accessible or. or affordable and accessible units within uh, within a development and, and tagging that to a certain uh, incentive either through tax uh, tax abatement or or something else but i think broadly speaking that's i expect that's how it would the best way to accomplish that through through the cip okay thank you lindsay um i i didn't have my hand up at the beginning but i i, I will speak so i had a comment on it which is i am pretty sure that there is policy in place that once you hit seven units, um, you do have to then incorporate an accessible unit. And I, I, I don't have it in front of me right now. I, I thought for some reason that was an Ontario uh, policy, uh, but it may just be a policy that's in Ottawa. 
Um, but I do know that uh, that exists in, in, in developments I've been a part of in Ottawa, where once you hit seven units, um, thereafter, you have to start having a ratio um, of access, uh, accessible units. Um, so I think that there is policy in place that we can definitely look into and should replicate. Um, and I think it should be under uh, seven units. It should be something more like four or five. Um, as well, I, I, I'm going to hamper on this point again. Uh, if a development does not have affordable or accessible units, you have to pay a development fee. Thank you. Carl, can you speak to that? Yes, yeah, so I, I believe it is a, an obese, an Ontario building code requirement for over uh, it's either six or seven units that I think 15% need to be uh, need to need to have barrier free components. And, and I think that's part of the challenge that we have is that it's, they require basically barrier free to get from the entry into the unit, but it doesn't go all the way in terms of creating fully accessible, a fully accessible unit. So I think that's, that's one area where, where I believe we are, and, and certainly one of the discussions that went around the council table earlier was was encouraging upgrades to the uh, the province to upgrade the building code to uh, to to provide for more meaningful accessibility in in situations like uh, like that. And as far as develop as to Lindsay's other point, as far as development charge rebates to encourage a, affordable or accessible housing, that's that's absolutely. Uh, that's absolutely on the table. I would, exp if, if we were to uh, adopt development charges in the town, I think a lot of municipalities rebate those or explore rebating those for, uh, for certain types of housing that, that fulfill a social need. So that's, I would imagine that would absolutely be on the table either through a CAP or, or something else if, if we were to go the DC route. Thank you. Lorraine, you had your hand up. Well, I was just going to ask, um... When we when we talk about certain number accessible, Lindsay, is you know we've been chatting about the fact that sometimes things can be accessible to get into it, but inside it's not accessible. So I mean, I wonder how we go about um, ensuring that it's both, because I, if someone in a wheelchair or someone that you know can't get in and out of places by themselves need their counters lower and all those things we talked about. And um, to me, that's really important in the whole process of seeing accessible. And, and that's, so I guess the question uh, circling back, um, do we, the CIP can speak to this as a Carl's point, um, and do we want to leave it uh, and have this as a section of the CIP where, where uh, applicants can apply for uh, funding uh, at the same time, do we want to uh, do some research into uh, a guidebook or, uh, and as well as maybe a, a universal statement that would encourage builders to consider including uh, fully accessible units as to a certain percentage? Recognizing, I mean, as an example, we had uh, another 51 units development come to council for site plan this week. So there's, there's, there's all kinds of uh, units being built right now and at various stages of development that um, I, I, I don't know if uh, fully accessible units are being contemplated, but uh, I, I would hope they would be, but I'd like to try and find a method of encouraging builders to, to include these in their developments. And it may I'm simply think in the, it may be a, simply a statement uh, generated from this advisory committee as a recommendation to council to, to make that statement and that our building department and our planning department would incorporate that into uh, the consultations they would have with builders. Not that we would have the ability to force a builder to do it, but to help them understand this is a priority for the municipality and the community. Lindsay? Um, on that, I'm wondering like, you know, any application of that, of that size or probably any application over four units that has to go before council uh, will require some sort of council vote, whether it's minor variance or a zoning amendment, or just simply the site control plan process. And at minimum, can there not be a policy part of the official plan, such as main floor commercial has to be in a building in, in the downtown core? Why can't a policy just be implemented 
where it's, it's actually a non-negotiable over four units, you must have this. And it's something that, you know, Carl will be responsible for communicating as part of the official plan um, where th there's no choice. It's, this is our policy. And I actually think we need policy, not just encouragement. It should, it has to be policy um, and it has to be implemented in some capacity to the official plan, such as, you know, again, if I, I was just speaking about this building on, on Market Street, right now that building can only have commercial on the main floor because within the official plan, you can only have commercial in those designated zones. I don't understand why policy cannot be created to say within any new development, there must be a ratio after three or more units. It, it should be in the official plan and that way it can actually just be mandated. And, and I'll, I'll circle back to Carl, but to my understanding, uh, to my understanding, what we have learned through this process is that uh, unless it is included in the interior, well, we don't have authority to, but perhaps Carl has a different perspective from a planning standpoint. So Lindsay raises an excellent and uh, interesting point. Certainly in terms of the land, fundamentally the land use, so a requirement for a commercial land use on the ground floor, that's, that's established through the planning, uh, through our planning policies. However, I'm not familiar, as familiar with planning policies, prescribing building, building standards such as this. So I think that's one thing that uh, I, before we can enact a policy like that, I, I would think we should get a, a legal opinion just to confirm that is within our, within the authority that the Planning Act prescribes us to, to create those policies under the OP. My, my first thought is this would be best dealt with through, through the code, but uh, I think we, we might need a we might need to just get a legal opinion just to confirm that, uh, that the Planning Act does, I guess, give us the authority to, uh, to regulate these sorts of matters in, in a policy document such as an official plan. So I, I can't say yes or, or no for sure. I think that, that would require a bit more research as far as, as, far as building standards. So, they, so Lindsay's maybe rang a bell here that, that requires further clarification. And so I guess at this point, uh, we'll, we'll ask Carl that you can do some research into this and see if that's something that we may want to consider and bring it back at a future meeting. So uh, rather than, I guess, going into uh, this universal statement, let's get that answer before we decide what our next steps would be. Does that seem suitable, everyone? Yeah? Okay. Thank you. So moving on, uh, OPA, uh, ZBLA for additional units. Uh, Carl. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So at the last uh, meeting, we uh, staff had circulated a uh, just a, a proposed amendment to uh, proposed amendments to our official plan and zoning bylaw to accommodate accessible or sorry to accommodate uh, additional residential units in uh, in more circumstances. So this is something that is required under provincial legislation that uh, the zoning bylaws and official plans contain these. Uh, contain supporting policies. However, municipalities do have some leeway in terms of how we want to, uh, to regulate that. So as you know, we are going through a, a comprehensive zoning review process to, uh, to update all of our zoning bylaw. However, the, uh, the, the committee is looking to, uh, to implement uh, additional residential unit policies earlier so that hope we can start seeing some of this development happening earlier. So we do have some official plan uh, so the policies that have circulated propose some official plan amendments that are largely just some minor wording changes to create the enabling policies. And then the real meat and potatoes is in the, uh, the zoning. So uh, we'd, uh, we presented, uh, I briefly over, uh, overviewed what was in the zoning a couple of weeks ago and uh, sort of left it, with, uh, left it with the committee to, to, to have a look at and, and see what, uh, what your thoughts are. At this stage of the uh, of the process, we do have a statutory public meeting that's required under the Planning Act next Thursday, being hosted by the Planning Advisory Committee. And uh, any feedback from the public or from the Planning Committee at that meeting, and any feedback from from this committee or or anybody else, will all be uh, conveyed to Council as part of uh, as part of a staff report and uh, and recommendations. So by no means is what's been circulated anything formal and final. It is 
like everything else, it's subject to change until uh, until the decision has been made. So I'll uh, welcome any uh, I'll welcome any feedback on on that. Thanks, Carl. Any additional feedback thoughts here? No, so, and I guess, uh, I think Carl, thank you for mentioning next week's meeting, public meeting. Uh, and obviously uh, all of us are invited to participate and uh, maybe we'll ask Carrie if she can uh, circulate um, for any details there uh, to ensure that anybody who wants to participate can, can tune in via Zoom. Okay, super. So, um, yes, Carl. And so this is not, uh, this meeting here is not your final opportunity. If, if the committee or if any individual members wanted to provide feedback, we, we'd welcome that any time before we bring the report to a uh, committee of the whole. And, and we anticipate that will be in, in early December. So there is still some time for, for feedback if you'd like questions, clarification, or, or, or suggestions. So Carl, can that be, and, and to carry, I guess, be circulated uh, back to the advisory committee for um, maybe some feedback uh, so our first first review before it comes to committee the whole, or is it should, it should it come to committee the whole first? Yeah, Carl? So, so typically once we have the, the proposed policy is, is made public and circulated prior to, uh, to the public meeting, and then at the committee of the whole meeting, we bring forward that proposed policy as well as an overview of public feedback, agency feedback, committee feedback that we've received, and then some recommendations for uh, for committee of the whole as to how we uh, how how we can respond to to those uh, to that feedback. So, if if it would be helpful, Mr. Chair, I can I can circulate the uh, I I can circulate the draft policies for uh, for uh, for everybody here. Yeah, that, that would be that'd be appropriate. And whether we have a chance to discuss it at the advisory committee or whether individual feedback can go back to you to form part of the overall feedback, uh, it'll depend on timing, I guess, and when it's coming to committee the whole and where our meeting schedule is. So, but we appreciate that. Okay. Um, moving on, rent supplements and current program update. Uh, Carrie, can you share your? Can you pull up the May twenty six? Presentation for Lanark County Housing and, and share your screen. Yes, so I can. Give me two seconds. And I'm trying to think what page. So maybe start at page eight, I think it is. Are you seeing it there? Um, yes. This is funding sources. There, okay. So as we've discussed before in this, uh, there are a number of programs uh, funded primarily provincially uh, to provide support uh, to, the, to the communities, uh, obviously us through Lanark County Housing. And keep going down here, the next screen, next page, sorry. Well, I think we're all familiar with uh, the, oh, the, yeah, rent geared to income. This is housing owned by Leonard County Housing. Uh, we have like 279 units in Smith Falls. Many have uh, been around for decades. They were built federally back in the 60s and 70s, is my understanding. Uh, the, the county is also embarking on uh, a review of the housing needs in, in addition to, uh, to what we were doing here. And we've been part of those discussions. So there's, I think, widespread acknowledgement and understanding that um, we all need to do, to do more. The rent supplement, um, portable housing benefit, are probably two of the most common tools that are available to the public. But if you go to the next page, Carrie, it might be there or a couple pages more, there, there shows that the allocations, um, where the money comes from, and uh, a fairly significant 
amount of dollars, but then by the time you start breaking that, that down, spreading it county, uh, there are times, and, and next page, please, I think it's somewhere in here, um, shows, I'll go back one page, sorry. Sorry. There. So it does show also our contribution to housing uh, at the county level. So this is part of what uh, the shared services agreement we have with the county and what we contribute to that total. So it is not an insignificant number. Next page. And next page. I think we're familiar with the continuum. Next page, please. Um, <coughs> next. And as you can see, there is um, a focus over, over from 2018, 2028, what the priorities are, but there's also, I think, a strong understanding and acknowledgement at the county level that things have changed even since 2018. And uh, we'll see how that happens going forward. But you can see the recommendations of portable housing benefit, uh, the additional 20 additional ones that were included uh, for 2020 and 2021. Uh, be no more, no additional ones in 2022, but in 2023, another 10. So every second year, an additional 10. But uh, again, across uh, a county with um, tens of thousands, or I'm not sure how many homes, but we know we have about 4, 000, over 4,000 units in town, uh, probably 2,400, roughly 2,500 rental units in town. And so an addition of 10 is, is fairly modest, and we don't know how that relates to the actual needs. Next page, please. And next page. Can you continue. Next page, please. Okay, so there's a description of the programs. Um, and and Ali, feel free to step in anytime because I know you're very familiar with with these programs and, and how they are utilized and any experience you have and any limitations. But to we to understanding the rent support is of $200 uh, can certainly help an old income individual uh, cover part of the cost of housing. But we're also seeing situations where people are moving from seven, $800 a month rent to, to double that uh, in many cases. So the 200 does help, but it, I don't think it's enough. Ellie? Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to note that like these are really great programs. Um, however, all of them except for the housing options program like are full and have a wait list um so that's always something to consider right yes um, and they are normally filled with a wait list within you know a couple weeks months of opening um and taking applications so as great as they are, they're not meeting the need um, across the townships. Thank you. And I, I think the next next page, Carrie, I was trying to find the one that one here does say that they are fully described, I think, through to 2023 right now. So, but next page, Carrie. Uh, next, sorry, next page. Uh, okay, maybe I'm not at the right, somewhere in here is, I, keep, I guess keep going, please. Uh, okay, stop there for a moment. No, not, next page, okay. I, so I guess I missed it, but it's somewhere in there, must have been earlier, it does indicate I think fully subscribed until like 2023. So that, to Ellie's point, well, they're great programs, they are limited in their reach. And we know that uh, there are probably far more people who could utilize these programs and uh, have a great op greater opportunity to uh, afford rent uh, if these programs were enhanced and had broader reach. Comments, questions? Um, just yeah, to kind of touch on, I think it's important to also note that um, a lot of individuals would use that HOPS money 
to pay for a hotel pre-COVID times. Um, so that only lasts for, you know, three nights if they were approved for that. Um, so I think that's something when we're looking at, you know, supporting individuals. Um, I mean, I've had individuals who access it because their apartment was full of cockroaches and they needed to move out because the landlord was willing to pay for the extermination of the cockroaches or bed bugs or whichever, but was not willing to put them up. Um, so, you know, then they had to use their hop funds for that. And then, you know, if they ever became in arrears within that year again, they weren't um, eligible for it. Um, so I think it's also important to note, or it'd be a good idea to consider, you know, what are we going to do for those emergency situations where people have to leave their home or people are on the street um, for a couple days or for a longer period of time? Um, because it's definitely been beneficial from my perspective, having kind of that two separate um, funding resources where people can go in a hotel, not have to use their HOP funding, and then, you know, can use that HOPs for their first and last still. Um, and don't have to worry about, okay, you know, pre-COVID and who's to say what it's going to look like post-COVID. Um, but we, you know, we can acknowledge that the funding is running out. Um, so, you know, it's going to go back. I, I, my guess would be it's going to go back to people have to decide, okay, well, am I going to go and live in a tent so that I can use my hop money for first and last? Or am I just not going to have first and last and pay for a hotel for a couple nights, right? So um, I think COVID really was able to highlight where that gap was. And also just to point out, um, hops like fluctuates. I'm not really sure. I, I don't like, it's not a local, um, locally we don't decide how much hops is. It's I think federally. Um, so, I mean, at one point this year, I got an email saying hops was only $500 um, for the year. And then just recently, I've been told it's been increased to, I think, $1,500. Um, so, it's just important to note that it, it kind of varies, too. Thank you. Jeff? I think it's reasonable to expect that the consultant that the county has hired will come to the conclusion that they need to increase funding for affordable housing. Um, I'm wondering if this group can impact uh, that report that this consultant is doing by sending something to those people saying, here's what our findings are, uh, given that the amount of money you have and the, the, the length of the wait list, we suggest that X, Y, or Z. So I, I, you know, we we should engage with that that business SHS who's doing the consultants. Um, either have them on a call or or send them kind of our take on all of this so that it can impact the outcome of the report they will issue to the county. And if there's certain things that we think the county should be doing, maybe that's the process that we can help that happen. So I, I would suggest uh, we could probably invite them to come to our future uh, meeting. There are two things on tonight's agenda at Community Services, uh, addressing homeless, homelessness in uh, United Counties and Leeds, Granville and Lanark issues and opportunities. And that's a uh, refat consulting report. That's a pretty lengthy document, issues and opportunities. And then uh, the second, uh, we may all recall that it was only last month or September, uh, the point in time count was completed. So the report on that is coming forward as well. So uh, there, there might be some good points of discussion coming into those that we can bring back to our next meeting. We figure it was preliminary, uh, too premature to bring it today before our county council has uh, community services a chance to deal with it. But uh, Carrie, to, to just point, I think we probably would be a good idea to connect with them and share our insights and our experiences and, and the limitations. We had reached out to the county uh, earlier this week to see if we could get some details regarding uh, wait lists and, and uh, if, they have an, if they can quantify um, what kind of shortfall truly exists. And I'm not sure if they're able to do that, 
but we'll share that when we have that as well uh, coming forward. But I think there's strong acknowledgement and understanding and, and um, unfortunately, Vicky's not here today. She had, she had raised this at a previous meeting about do we, do we create uh, a rent bank? Do we do something that can uh, provide support to our community? And, and that's why we wanted to bring this forward again to um, discuss it, recognizing there's a shortfall, but um, not knowing one, I guess, how practical it would be. Obviously, it would not make sense for, uh, for the town to uh, replicate what the county is doing or even augment if it meant we had to have a bureaucracy to support that. Uh, it, would be, it would be just too expensive to maintain that. This wouldn't make any sense. So, that, and then from a practicality standpoint, if, um, if our council decided that we wanted to provide money towards a rent bank and have the county administer it, um, is that a reasonable alternative or is that even practical as well? So I, I appreciate the, um, the intent behind these suggestions. I guess the question becomes, is there a how that makes sense? And understanding the gaps, I mean, uh, one, one individual uh, getting $200 a month rent support is, let's say, $2,400 in a year. Uh, so even if that $100,000 might help 40 people. Uh, while well, it's meaningful for 40, it doesn't go far enough. So it, it's a challenge that I don't know if we can even truly quantify. Jeff? I think that it's, for that one, it's probably time to talk to the county about, you know, I just say, look, we're brainstorming here. We think that people in Smith Falls will help support people in Smith Falls in the form of a rent bank. We're not about to get in the business. Uh, is there an opportunity that we can partner? And I, what I love about it is it challenges other communities. There's so many of us sitting on these damn Zoom calls thinking, I wish there was something that I could do personally to help. And you know, many of us can afford to uh, donate $100 a month or 50 bucks a month that could go towards helping people with rent supplement in Smith Falls or in Carlton Place or in Mississippi Mills. Um, but I, I think the, the logistics are such that we need to find out what Shauna thinks of this and Kurt and, and see if there's a viable, simple way to do it and not duplicate any of the administration that already happens through the county. Um, I, I think it's a marvelous idea. I think Indeed. service clubs would get engaged. I think there, there's lots of, lots of people that are concerned. That's that image of someone living in a tent will, will galvanize people. I know it's, it's like food banks in the early days. They weren't supposed to be here forever, um, but they seem to be needed. And this seems to be needed. Until we can get more housing built, we need to support people in the housing that, that they've got or trying to get. So, thank you, Lindsay. Yeah, I, I, like I, I um, echo a lot of what Jeff has said. I think one thing to like kind of acknowledge when you're trying to implement change, and always you want to think about what have we done that has not worked what is not working, what is maintaining the status quo and exploring changing the status quo. It's hard. So definitely putting together the framework of some sort of rent bank is a large endeavor. And I think it's something that will take discussions for over a year to figure out how could this logistically work uh, to create the right framework and policies and making sure we're not replicating something. But I think it's similar to this committee where maybe a group of people are going to have to make time uh, to try to put together a solution. Um, and it's going to be hard work, but that is what's required for change. And I think if we created some constant engagement with Lanark County housing, I mean, they're very aware of the fact, I think, that you know, the less that we can burden them, the more of an impact they can also have themselves. So versus everyone, you know, a uh, thousand people getting twenty dollars, 
maybe 100 people could get $200. And I think it's a matter of figuring out how we can like lessen their burden so that they can have more power with their funds that they do get. And then how can we create more power with more local funds? But, you know, I, I, similar to the food bank, asking people at the local grocery stores, do you want to donate a dollar in addition to your purchase today? And implementing initiatives like that, it will go a long way. And I think creating framework that helps long-term change is important. So maybe it's working with a group of renters, maybe, maybe 10, maybe 10 people submit their name and get chosen to be like, hey, we're going to work with you for a year. And hopefully at the end of that year, you will not be on a list. And then we'll work with 10 more people the next year. Um, but the biggest thing is making sure we're not just putting money into something or putting time and, and efforts to that they just keep replicating themselves. And I think we have a lot of work to do. Uh, I definitely feel the town of Smith Falls is committed to this. So I feel like there's people willing to do it, but a lot of work has to go into actually facilitating change. And it's changing the status quo. It's scary because it, it could fail. Um, but I think it's scary staying in where, what we're doing right now, which is just using, I mean, using the resources that are available and the uh, organizations that are available, but they can only do so much. And we're seeing that every year and it's starting to become exponential. So I think, I think we have to just take a stab at something. Um, and if we fail, we fail. I doubt we will. Thank you. Well, I think there's widespread acknowledgement that um, this issue is not going away and it's only going to get worse. Uh, and uh, the, the members of our community who are being more, further marginalized due to rising housing costs, rising food costs, are, are left even uh, more vulnerable uh, as a result of what's happened in recent years through the pandemic and, and of course the rise in inflation and food costs right now. And there are other initiatives underway to try and help uh, with that, but speaking to the housing on the housing front, and I know there is widespread uh, community support that may help contribute to something like this. Uh, from a timing standpoint, we, we are, we, the one challenge we have right now is we are, the town is moving into budget, uh, county council is a full day budget meeting, I think next Friday or the Friday after. And uh, the opportunity to um, add something new to the budget after even first draft is, is very slim to none. And uh, as the other part of this, this is the countywide problem. As much as we are committed to doing what we can for our, our community, you know, Smith Falls, we know that we're not the only ones uh, seeing these issues. And uh, perhaps it's time that County Council itself uh, consider augmenting those provincial dollars to support some of these programs. And if that's the case, it would also mean that the levy that Smith Falls pays uh, would be would go up based on the proportion allocated to our community if there was an increase and, and county funding that goes to these in some form or other of rent subsidy. So uh, any other comment here before, yeah, Lindsay? Uh, just one thing on, uh, obviously with the budget uh, unfolding and likely being finalized soon, it's, it's a hard ask to ask for anything when there's nothing even concrete. But I think what could be asked is maybe setting aside some sort of fee similar to the consulting fees that have been paid uh, to go towards reviewing zoning bylaws. Can $20,000 be set aside for 2022 that can be tapped into if we were to retain a consultant to help us create framework for a rent bank? I think that'd be a very good investment. Um, to figure out how could we actually facilitate something. Um, but I think it's worth creating a bit of a reserve to bring in professionals who have a different perspective and aren't just planning based professionals, um, but professionals that pull from a lot of different uh, experience and resources that stem from, you know, dealing with homelessness, also mental health, which is a huge like contributor to uh, homelessness and, uh, 
I, I just think maybe we can just say, put aside like 10 grand this year for us to maybe use towards figuring out what we can do. Thank you. And uh, well, I think it's a, a good suggestion, meaningful suggestion. The challenge I would see at the municipal level would be um, the accountability to our taxpayers on, what, I guess one, the not knowing how that money could be used uh, and what it may go to. Um, so I don't know, uh, I'm not sure. Jeff? I certainly don't have authority to direct staff to do do work, but it, it would be nice if there was sort of a literature review done to find out are there other communities that have done rent banks similar to what we're proposing. You know, Lindsay and I both have kind of ideas how this might run. Be interesting to know if there's a community about the size of Lanark County that's done this successfully and how they've done it. Yeah, great point. And perhaps it's something we can spend some time researching and, and it may be simply going as far as, as a county, they may already be familiar with it because at, at the upper tier level, they may be seeing what's happening elsewhere. But I think uh, maybe a, an appropriate next step here uh, would be that uh, we have a dialogue with the county, with county housing, uh, Emily and Sean or one or the other or both, to um, one, understand where they perceive the gaps exist and see if they're at all able to quantify the, the gap between current realities and where the needs land and to see if there's any consideration to uh, asking county council to go places that may not have gone before in, in helping fund uh, some form of rent bank to support the people of our broader communities. So, so that might be a fair first step and we can circle back with some details on those conversations and same time uh, see, and, and it wouldn't surprise me if there are uh, upper tier municipalities or, or cities that are doing this. I guess, I, frankly, I think cities do. They, they, they tend to have a bigger issue of, of homelessness and obviously are committing dollars over and above what the province contributes uh, to housing needs within their within their municipalities, but the big difference between uh, a city making a decision on this and uh, numerous municipalities within one county, all having different needs and wants, uh, and uh, the challenge, of course, in, in Lanark County, being this is largely an urban issue. Jeff, you have something else to go into add, or just your hand still up? Oh, you're muted. Just thinking that a matching grant wouldn't be a bad idea as well, that, that if a certain amount of money was raised in the community, it, it would there'd be a nice incentive if it was a matching grant, that the municipality that's going to benefit or the county that's going to benefit would match whatever funds are raised in the community. But that's up for negotiation, uh, talking with the county and just seeing what they think, but just something not to forget. Okay. So at this stage, what'll, um, we will uh, plan for a dialogue with the county and, uh, and I, I may have a chance to speak to this tonight at, at County Council if that's part of the conversation based on the, the whole, I haven't read the whole report yet, but uh, regardless, I think we'll, we'll keep this, um, we'll add this back to our next agenda for further discussion and, and feedback from what we've learned. And um, that's still, we're gonna have the first draft of our budget, I think, in two weeks, I believe, or a week from Monday. Pardon, 22nd? November 22nd. Okay. So we won't be meeting again before then, but we should be meeting not long after that. Our next meeting is scheduled for the 24th. Okay. So quite close after. Okay. Um, final item, uh, rent evictions. And Terry, if you can throw that letter from Sarnia back up. And, my, and to my my family memory, uh, when this came to, to committee the whole on Monday, I asked that we bounce it back to the Housing Advisory Committee and Carrie was going to advise me afterwards that we'd already done that. <laughs> but um, so, so I don't think there's any, any issue with, with the council ultimately supporting this letter, but I, uh, I'm, 
my, my, my thoughts are, we, is this enough? And, and recognizing that we hear on virtually a weekly basis that another landlord in town has issued N13s to members of our community advising that they are being evicted for renovation purposes. And sometimes that's warranted, uh, sometimes it isn't. Uh, we know that through Linda Tranter's efforts at the legal clinic, she can, if she is involved, she can help ensure that uh, these people are protected and get everything they're entitled to and have the ability or the right to move back in uh, if the landlord tenant board does order an eviction for renovations. But practically speaking, uh, some landlords are taking three or six months to renovate a unit or longer sometimes. Um, those individuals need somewhere else to go. And quite often once they're moved and settled, they're not going back to where they were before. So I just wanted to, before we send this back to committee the whole, um, have another little discussion on this to see if there's more that we should be doing, understanding that uh, members of our community are being evicted through this N13 strategy. Lindsay? Just, I, I think the main thing um, which Linda brings to the table a lot is providing information on, on what is legal and what's not legal and what's a right and, and what isn't a right. And, you know, I don't know, recognizing that not everyone has access to the internet too. I'm just almost wondering if the town as a whole should just like be mindful of, of paper waste, like little like flyers once a month. What are your rights as a tenant and just start mailing them out and then people might get them and realize oh wow I like I've just got this notice this week and I just got this flyer in the mail and I actually may not have to do what my landlord's telling me to do um, because you know often people are not um, you know for example uh, joining seminars uh, to get educated um, about their rights and stuff and I think the more we can just push out information to either remind uh, tenants about their rights um, or provide information to those who may just still not, not know it. Um, it is something that can be a positive impact um, to people who are renters. It's almost like when you get the, the bell flyer or the Rogers flyer going, you know, did you know, like you could get a competitive rate like this. It's just kind of a constant uh, reminder of, of really what your rights are. And I'm just wondering if something like that can be distributed like every two months or something, um, just a simple pamphlet and then like a link, you know, go to this link if, you know, if you have internet access and a computer where you can find out more information because often people, when they get that notice, they get so scared, actually they forget what the knowledge that they already know. And so if they're being reminded about it on a semi reoccurring basis, unconsciously they start Kind of remembering it more and more and going no i i do have a right so I, I don't own this home but i have a rights as a tenant um and i'm just thinking that's maybe something we can do or the town should do um it's a it's an added probably task for someone within the town but um i think it's a way of reaching a lot of people who you know haven't been reached before and again just that reoccurrence and rem reminder just because you get an n13 doesn't mean you have to do what the landlord says. Um, so I'm just wondering if, if things like that can be done to just, again, remind people about their rights. Thanks, Lindsay. And I think to the point we, we can't communicate enough and, and it's and quite often it's only relevant, I think as you suggested, it's only relevant at the time that they are facing crisis. And, if uh, they had seen something a few months earlier, then perhaps they know where to go and to look for help. But uh, that repetition probably is not a bad thing. The question becomes, I guess, how we would do that. And uh, uh, obvious first thought would be if the various agencies, if, if we did produce a tenant guide uh, that could be distributed to various agencies, um, simply as an example, would the food bank be willing to put them in with the, the food hampers that they're handing out just so that so most vulnerable people in our community who are primarily, mostly largely tenants, I would think, uh, 
see that um, where the community lunches are being handed out. Do they, can they tuck that into a, a brown bag lunch? Uh, can we distribute to our faith-based organization so that they're also aware because quite often someone who was facing a challenge who would attend the church would, would go to the priest or minister to look for some guidance to so help, help, um, help educate the, the advisors as well. Uh, the social yeah. service work, different organizations. And I guess so, but I think we, yeah. I guess the gist of what you're suggesting is, suggesting is that we put together a, a little flyer, which speaks to tenant rights. And of course, Linda covered so much of this so well in her workshop. But again, uh, if you didn't attend the workshop and you're not on Facebook or YouTube or the town's website, uh, you're not going to see this. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. I guess I'll uh, wonder just what your thoughts are on our ability to put something together, uh, and uh, we can put it, create a distribution list and it be shared via email and, and other methods. And mm -hmm. in a day and age when we are always inundated with information, that sometimes it is that repetition, unfortunately, which we have to do in order to make sure the message reaches as many people as possible. Uh, the other thing I think we could do probably is another one listens to the radio, but we could probably do uh, in focus on Lake 88. Uh, Bob is pretty good to, to accommodate those things and try and get the message out. But again, the best we can do is, is continue to distribute the as broadly as, and as frequently as possible. Yeah. I think Jeff? distributing, uh, sorry, sorry to jump in there. Just where you've mentioned like having flyers be available to go, like those like constant daily places where, you know, members of, of our vulnerable community are going um, so versus just in their mailbox. And some people may just not check their mailbox. Um, I think that's an excellent idea. Um, and I think, you know, that hard copy is probably required to quite a few people within the community, again, who don't have access uh, to computers and the internet. Thank you. Jeff? I would say start with Linda. She, this, this is really her wheelhouse. Uh, whatever you would put together, you really need to run it by her anyway. So maybe it's part of her mandate. Maybe she's already got something. Uh, maybe it's easy for her to just take her PowerPoint and make it into a brochure. I, I would suggest starting with her because she's she sees what comes before her and she would know what the hot button, you know, which ones to tackle in a brochure. We can certainly help with distribution. Um, it's something that uh, we wouldn't mind doing through CareBridge, but I think that once something is created, there's a network of agencies across the county that would take flyers or print them and, and distribute them. So, uh, but I would start with her. Great, and we can do that. And and I think there's probably information available online, obviously that would speak to this, but it's a matter of taking a whole bunch of information, con condensing it down to the most critical points uh, so people don't get lost in the information. Um, so yeah, I think uh, we can definitely reach out to to Linda uh, to do that. Any other comments here, yeah, Lindsay? I, I think just one thing to add to any type of information um, is to make it quite simplistic um, and also quite guidable. So um, you know, allowing a reader to easily read and kind of offer the the path forward. Um, as they're reading it uh, would be important. But like Jeff has mentioned, I mean, Linda probably could send us or someone or herself a uh, PDF or her slideshow uh, or her um, PowerPoint. But I think just also recognizing uh, it's gotta be extremely um, user-friendly in, in terms of reading and understanding too. And I think there's, there's maybe two or three points we want covered. I think not just renovations, but sale of property, uh, suggestions gonna be owner occupied or all those things we can sort of cover in a, in a few points. And, and obviously I mean, Linda's contact information on there, but I also understand um, Linda is overrun <laughs> and I'm not sure about her capacity to take on even additional cases at this stage. Ellie, from your experience, um, you're dealing, dealing, you've dealt primarily with youth but uh, have you seen situations where they are being unjustifiably evicted without understanding their rights? Yeah, I mean, you've definitely seen 
it being tried. Luckily, the youth tend to let me know, um, hey, my landlords, you know, told me I'm being evicted. Um, and then kind of as soon as you delve into the paperwork, it's non-legit or it's, you know, a text message rather than actual paperwork. Um, or it is those, you know, non-proof of, it is those rent evictions, right? Where they have to prove that they are moving in and they can't and there's no affidavit being signed. Um, there's been a couple instances where, you know, we have called Linda up and um, she's represented them at the landlord tenant board um, just because there's been, you know, kind of continual instances. Um, with that being said, you know, I've also had youth being, um, I guess, given, you know, $1,000, $2,000 to leave um, by the end of the month. And of course, when you're living in property, that's a significant amount of money. And it's very hard to talk someone out of that and to make them see kind of the long-term consequences of that. And the fact that there is no housing that they're going to be able to find within their budget um, so and yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's a shady business in that sense. Um, yeah, not painting all landlords with the same brush, but there are some who are. And I had one this week, exactly that. Uh, by the time I was aware of it, they had already signed the N11 or I'm not sure which one it was. Uh, they'll get their 1500 bucks to move out within a very short period of time. And unfortunately, that's going to be going to stay in a hotel for... 10 days and, and we don't know what the, what's going to happen after that. So as you said, it's helping them see the longer term picture. Yeah. One thing that, you know, we really stress to the youth that we work with is do not sign anything until um, we get legal support to look at it. Mm -hmm. um, so that kind of holds them off um, because I mean, of course we have had some instances where people, Think that's great I, especially more at the beginning of COVID I think people are now kind of grasping um, how difficult it is to find housing um, but especially at the beginning of COVID when it wasn't so um, prevalent for everyone you know we were getting phone calls saying oh my goodness like my landlord just offered me like you know 1500 bucks to move out in 35 days I signed the paper like I can't wait woohoo like let's you know what I mean and now I think there's a bit more um awareness of what's happening um and what kind of you know consequences those are going to have on the individual thank you lindsay do you have another comment yeah my only other comment is wondering um you know when landlords or new owners like blatantly lie i'm just like wondering why there's no legal recourse because i actually had someone reach out to me this week asking if i had any units because they were advised that their, their house is being demolished, that they have no choice. And uh, so I, I actually spoke with them and like actually told them what to say, because um, they were, but they were lied to. Basically the, the owner just said, well, it's coming down. So you're either coming down in it with it or you're leaving. <laughs> and it's just like, you, you know, like what, why, why can people just say lies? Um, and, and really violate uh, like a lot of rights actually without um, at least being fined for it. And that's, you know, if uh, I, the amount of times I've seen landlords write tenants going, oh, you know, I'm just, like, I have unfortunately dealt with a lot of uh, uh, landlords in Ottawa who have that mindset, oh, just say this and, and they're gonna move out. And that they're knowingly lying they're then writing a story to the tenant just with the uh, end goal of this. It's all with bad intent. And, but, but there's actually no uh, uh, recourse of, of actually them being held accountable. There's no accountability once that happens. And um, I, I, I don't think anything's ever been created uh, to hold people accountable to not, not lying or or making up stories or saying, well, you know, the house is coming down, it's booked. Well, you know, I'm book it, like, <laughs> you know, um, but that's where I'm almost wondering, like, I feel like something needs to be done. You know, it's like lying under oath in a way you can, you know, you can be charged for that. Um, and I'm just curious why actually nothing's ever been implemented. 
Well, if, if someone does issue an N13 for that eviction for renovations and it is deemed to be fraudulent by the time it makes its way to the landlord tenant board, there is a risk of fine. But I'm sure there is one if someone simply knocks the door of their tenant and says, you got to move out, I'm, I'm, I'm tearing the place down. Like, yeah, so good point. And I'm not sure where that falls in law. Maybe uh, we can uh, Linda, we can bounce it off Linda. Maybe she can provide some, some guidance here. Carrie? A couple of things. First of all, it scares me sometimes how much I feel that Jeff Mills is in my head uh, because I had reached out to um, to Linda uh, already on, when, on Monday evening, actually during council, um, when, we, when it was brought up as a correspondence item, I reached out to her and you are right, Sean, I immediately got an out of office reply saying that she was uh, not taking on any more clients, but to, you know, call the, whatever the number was, I should know it off by heart after uh, she had to repeat it so many times during the workshop. Um, so she, uh, she emailed me back actually right away um, and uh, read the motion. And uh, she said she wanted just to think about it a little bit more because I asked her to think about um, maybe what we could add to this uh, resolution from Sarnia uh, to make it a little bit stronger or, um, you know, maybe make it more relevant to our area. So she was going to think about it and get back to me. So hopefully she'll respond and we can uh, discuss it at more length at our next meeting. Um, as well. And then the other thing I wanted to bring up was um, I can reach out to her and find out that Lindsay, if um, you know, what are the repercussions for landlords who, uh, who do lie. Um, but uh, at this point, I was kind of thinking maybe she could come to an upcoming meeting, but it sounds like her schedule is quite crammed. So um, we'll see, hopefully she corresponds via email at least. And then uh, we can maybe add to this, this motion and bring forward a, a motion to council that it may stand as is, or it may be, we may add to it just to give it a little more Smith Falls flair. Okay. Well, thanks, Carrie. So let's, um, again, let's leave it, also leave this on our next agenda. So I think there's more work that we would like to see completed here and to do all we possibly can to protect our citizens who are facing this tactic. Okay. So that's the end of our agenda. Um, we don't generally have a round table, but I'll throw that out there today if there's anything anybody else wants to, to raise. Jeff? Just before we leave that last issue, I wonder if we have any data on this. You know, it'd be nice to include, it, it makes it stronger if you can say we've had a, a certain number of people displaced because of this issue. Um, it's, it's probably not something that the town would track. Is there some way that it could be? Uh, so, so two things here, I guess. One, I think we can, we can ask Linda about her, she would be dealing with this, at least whatever reaches her. Yeah. Um, I also did reach out to our building department earlier in the week to see if they have any insights, but I'm not sure um, it, would only, it would only be in those situations if a building permit application was uh, requested. Or submitted, and um, and I guess one of our staff would be aware that this there be people are being evicted because of that. So I've asked them to uh, provide some feedback. So, but you're right. I don't sure how we would determine these numbers. <laughs> uh, I, think we, going, we, I would <laughs> suggest going forward, if there was a mechanism, it would be a good thing to start, uh, and it could be as part of the building uh, permit process that you find out who the tenant is and then find out whether they can afford to move back in. Um, well, if we're back in, if we're to move back in should be an issue when they have to keep the rent the same. But the reality is if someone's gonna invest significantly in, in renovating a unit, they definitely don't want to provide it the same rent as that before. Uh, that so, so probably the percentage of people displaced would be relatively high. And all I'm saying is, as part of that building permit process, if you could follow up at the end, because you've got to do a final inspection, right? It would be nice to know um, who the new tenant is and what the difference in what the difference in rent is and whether someone didn't come back. Yeah, so we'll, um, I'll see what we hear back from the building department. 
probably going to get into it later this week and I can circulate that, but uh, perhaps another point of discussion when we meet again. I, I, and I don't know if there's, if there'd be merit in, in just doing a, a brief survey to the community. Again, uh, to some of the points made earlier, well, we can distribute that via social media uh, and get the word out there very, through various means. We may not be reaching everybody we want to reach, but Again, it, it maybe still, if we, if we got a handful of responses or so many responses, it might give us insight that we don't have today. <laughs> Lindsay? Um, uh, two things. One, just actually on the survey, um, before uh, our first meeting, I believe, uh, the, the survey that was previously done, um, I actually looked at that survey. And, and definitely, I think if there's surveys being sent out to try to collect data, on uh, uh, affordable housing, uh, those who are finding themselves homeless, et cetera. However, the means of distribution was done on that first survey is definitely not how it should be done. Because uh, when I read that survey, the, the number of respondents who said that they owned homes, it, it clearly showed that it didn't reflect uh, the appropriate pool of people that uh, I think were the intended uh, people to be surveyed. Uh, so I think when it comes to surveying and any data that is collected, to your point, Sean, on uh, actually even the flyers, we have to make those surveys available. At, uh, a lot of organizations that, you know, are, are frequented by a lot of the members uh, of the vulnerable community, homeless community, um, so that they can actually fill them out in person because uh, they likely don't have the ability to access them through an email or whatever. Um, so just on a, a, a point of actual collecting the data, uh, the distribution needs to be uh, changed quite a bit, I think. And just when I read the data that was collected on the, the one survey, because um, yeah, I think it was like 40% of the people owned homes and that, that was just not, uh, not uh, the demographic or type of people I think it was intended for. My only other comment, just because there's time is, and I'm, I'm not sure, I don't think I've gotten clarity on this. Um, what are we doing about uh, paying permit fees? Because again, um, and development fees, I guess actually, so adding density, um, because it's just, the town currently operates without collecting any of these monies. And you, know, we, you mentioned that the new proposal for 51 units and if a development fee of $2,000 was applied to that, which is cheap, um, that is a lot of money uh, that still makes financial sense for that development to go forward with, to pay to the town that could be put aside strictly for uh, uh, addressing affordability and accessibility. Um, and it could go towards funding the uh, affordability fund too. Um, and I just wanted to know where are we at with that because I am aware of a lot of developments uh, being submitted that will be going through final planning and then having the permit issued in 2022. And those will be, you know, units that could uh, have fees associated with them if policy is implemented soon. Um, and it's just a, such a huge opportunity loss for the town right now, I find. Great, great question, great question, Lindsay, and I'll, I'll go to Carl, who is managing uh, our, our development charges uh, study, and um, to if he's able to bring an update on when that he expects that to come back to council. Hi, I think I'll actually I'll uh, pass this over to uh, to Carrie. I believe that uh, I believe that uh, Janet, our treasurer, is going to be bringing an update to council either on the twenty second or shortly after. Carrie, could you uh, could you please confirm? Nope, that's correct. Uh, that's correct, Carl. So the council hasn't made any decision on uh, DCs yet, Lindsay. Um, right now, uh, Treasurer Koziel, she's been the staff resource kind of uh, doing this study. Uh, so I think they're at the point now where, like Carl said, with probably either the next one, the next committee, the whole either the 22nd or uh, early December, will be bringing forward their first report to council or their findings from the DC study. So um, council hasn't even received that yet. So that's probably you'll before the um, before this year ends, you'll probably see a report before council. 
So if that comes on the 22nd, we can bring that here on the 24th mm -hmm. uh, for some discussion. We know there will be uh, probably varied opinions on the merits of, uh, of a DC bylaw. And uh, from both sides of the perspective, I'm sure it will be a fairly contentious issue. So uh, it'd be great for the, our committee to weigh in on that. Okay. Anything further before we wrap up early today? Well, thanks everyone for your time and uh, your ongoing commitment to helping create a better bank of housing and uh, affordable housing and uh, quality of life for our citizens. So we look forward to reconnecting on the 24th. Have a good afternoon, everybody.